So welcome, Dr. Fishman. I think a few uh, more folks have joined and continue to do so. So I'll just again give a quick reminder that we welcome everyone and invite you to introduce yourself um, in the chat. So uh, please let us know uh, who you are and where you're joining us from. Let us know what practice or program. It's a nice way to get to know each other and for us to get to know you. We just won't have the time to do any introductions um, because of the anticipated size of the group. Uh, we won't be able to do that verbally, but it's a great way for us to get to know you and for you to get to know each other. And I will, as I just, you heard us doing this sort of uh, real quick impromptu planning, I will just do a couple housekeeping items and then introduce Dr. Fishman and turn it over to him. And at the end of our time today, uh, we will facilitate questions that um, anyone leaves in the chat and open it up for discussion at the end. So please feel free to throughout the uh, webinar this afternoon, enter questions in the chat and we will monitor those and be sure to uh, feed those to Dr. Fishman um, at the end of the conversation. So I won't take a ton of time, but I do wanna welcome Dr. Fishman and just orient everyone to our session this afternoon. We're really excited to be doing a sort of mashup webinar. Uh, the two programs, Maryland Addiction Consultation Service and Maryland VHIP are coming together um, with Dr. Fishman this afternoon to bring you this content, which is sort of a second part in a series. He joined us a couple months ago and today is talking about improving the treatment of opioid use disorder in youth. So we're excited to hear this discussion. And I will just give a quick overview of what BHIP and MAX are for folks that might, might be new um, to joining this series of webinars. So Maryland BHIP is the Child Psychiatry Access Program for the state of Maryland. We provide uh, free access to training, consultation, um, and educational opportunities across the state of Maryland for pediatric primary care providers. Um, so you'll see brief information about that, but we wanna remind providers that we're available uh, virtually. So if you have questions or uh, would like access to support, please feel free to call and the numbers here on the slide. And very similarly, Max offers free training consultation, technical assistance, and education related to the treatment of patients with substance use disorders or chronic pain management needs in um, any setting, primary care or other treatment settings across the state of Maryland. And again, information um, about how to reach us is here on this slide. So I won't take more time talking about our services, but I will briefly introduce um, Dr. Fishman, who we're excited to have with us. Um, Dr. Fishman is a consultation, uh, excuse me, a consultant with Max. We're excited to have him as part of our team. And he is an addiction psychiatrist, as well as the medical director of Maryland Treatment Centers. He's also a member of the psychiatry faculty of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Fishman leads Maryland Treatment Centers, a regional behavioral health care provider, which includes Mountain Manor Treatment Centers in Baltimore and Emmitsburg, as well as several other inpatient and outpatient programs. In that role, he's been involved in development and implementation of innovative programming in addiction and co-occurring disorder treatment. His clinical specialties include treatment of drug involved in dual diagnosis youth, opioid addiction in adolescents and adults, and addiction with co-occurring psychiatric disorders. His research work has focused on medication treatment for substance use disorders, as well as models of care and treatment outcomes in youth, in particular opioid addiction, which we'll hear more about today. Um, Dr. Fishman's also been president of the Maryland Society of Addiction Medicine and is currently a member of its board. We're really delighted to have him back for this uh, second webinar. So I'll turn it over Dr. Fishman to you and we look forward uh, to the talk and question and discussion that follows. Thank you. Great, well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me come to the beginning of the talk here. Um, just to uh, put out my disclosures, uh, I think the one that's probably most relevant is I've had some um, consultation and research funding from Alchemies, which, as you may know, makes uh, extended release naltrexone or Vivitrol, and I'll be talking about uh, that as a treatment today. So I, I hope that hasn't biased me, but you guys will be the judge. And then this is what we're going to talk about today, um, treating youth, uh, that is adolescents and young adults, or as, as they say in Brooklyn, youths. Uh, with opioid use disorder, opioid use, opioid addiction, and uh, talking about what is the evidence show us, uh, a little bit about uh, the background, uh, epidemiology, scope of the problem, although everybody knows it's a, a terrible issue, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. 
um, thinking about what are some of the developmental vulnerabilities that youth bring to the table uh, in the course of their disorder and their response to treatment and how those things might provide uh, unfortunate barriers to success along the treatment cascade for OUD. Uh, talk about emerging models of care and what the evidence tells us about the use of particularly medications for OUD uh, in the treatment of OUD in youth. Uh, there's not as much research as we might like and certainly not as big a body of research uh, as there is in adults, but enough, I, I think, to, to clearly guide our treatment. Uh, and now I'll spend some time talking about actions. Uh, I'll emphasize a project uh, that uh, my group's been working on with assertive outreach, uh, home delivery, and family involvement, but also want to talk about primary care integration and the possibilities for recovery housing, and uh, then get a chance for some questions and discussion. This is kind of um, the summary, if you will, uh, of what we'll be talking about today, and we'll come back uh, to the various details of this and, and then conclude with a recap. But OUD really should be thought of, I think, as an advanced malignant form of substance use disorder as a whole. So, sure, opioids are different in their pharmacology. Uh, they're certainly more severe. Uh, we know about uh, overdose and overdose death. But it's very important, and when we talk about prevention, I think it's especially important to think about how OUD is embedded in the broader view of SUD writ large. Uh, and it doesn't begin I think with first initiation of an opioid, which is usually later than first initiation of other intoxicating substances, but that earlier experience with loss of control uh, is very formative in laying the groundwork for what I'm calling this advanced malignant form of the disorder. Young adults are disproportionately affected uh, by opioid use disorder currently uh, during this current epidemic uh, in the US. There is evidence and consensus, which we'll elaborate a bit, for the use of MOUD, that is medications for the treatment of OUD in youth. But unfortunately, dissemination is poor. There are problems with capacity, with misinformation, with prejudice, and part of what we'll be talking about is overcoming some of those uh, barriers. But developmental vulnerability uh, in these young people is certainly prominent, and that makes outcomes unfortunately not as good in this target youth population than the outcomes in older adults. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, uh, we need to be thinking about improved and developmentally informed strategies that can emphasize improvements in engagement, in retention, and medication adherence, and presumably such strategies could help, although we are in the infancy of developing those strategies. And one thing in particular that I've been very excited about, which I'll talk about, is a project we call the Youth Opioid Recovery Support Intervention, or yours, but also uh, several others that have promises as such innovative approaches. So that's kind of the talk in a nutshell. So a word up. Uh, you heard me say this, those of you who uh, heard the, the last, uh, the previous chapter when I talked more broadly about approach in youth, and the focus really there was on alcohol and cannabis uh, and earlier uh, forms uh, of SUD prior to the initiation in this subset that use opioids. But we want to think about addiction as a developmental disorder of pediatric onset, right? Most people who have this order, disorder over the lifespan get started uh, towards the second half of the second decade uh, and the beginning of the third decade, and peak prevalence is towards uh, the end of the second decade, you know, 19, 20, 21. So that's the place where all the action is, and uh, we ought to be reaching back into its formative origins in adolescence and young adulthood rather than only focusing on the, the malignant later forms uh, in later adulthood. Not that we won't treat people who are older, but we ought to be working on treatment earlier on. Turns out that the vast majority of youth who initiate opioids have had problems and loss of control with other substances. People generally don't develop addiction 
with their first exposure to opioids. Not that it doesn't happen, but most young people who get into trouble with opioids have been in trouble with other things, typically cannabis, alcohol, nicotine, before they got to opioids. We know that earlier onsets associated with worse outcomes. We know that earlier intervention is associated with better outcomes. So again, thinking of opioid addiction as an advanced stage in the progression and evolution of this illness. And in that way, working on intervention for the earlier non-opioid SUDs, cannabis, alcohol, and nicotine, is in itself an OUD prevention strategy. All right, now let's talk about the scope of the problem. Uh, just to make the point here, this is non-medical use of prescription opioid analgesics. Uh, it's The data doesn't get quite uh, up to the current, but you can see a snapshot showing us that young adults have the highest per capita prevalence of non-medical prescription opioids across the lifespan. And the same is true for heroin. The amplitude of the percent using is obviously much smaller, but again, young adults, that is 18 to 25, have the highest prevalence across the lifespan of the use of heroin. Not that people at other points in the lifespan aren't using, uh, but the the the, uh, the percentage among uh, young adults is higher. So they're disproportionately affected. So next chapter, what's the treatment evidence? What do we know? Uh, you guys, I'm sure know uh, about uh, the long and storied accumulated research evidence for MOUD in general in older adults reaching back, you know, to uh, 60 years of evidence for methadone, 30 years of evidence for buprenorphine, 15 or so years of evidence for extended release naltrexone. Those are the three uh, FDA approved MOUDs. And so that's an old story and should be a settled story in terms of standard of care treatment for adults. But what about young people? What do we know? And we don't know as much but we still know a fair bit. We know plenty. And so just to give you a quick overview of the evidence base, and here's one of the great granddaddies or grandmommies of, uh, of youth opi MOUD treatment evidence. This was um, CTN 10 or, or youth opioid study from the Clinical Trials Network. George Woody from the University of Pennsylvania was the lead investigator of this seven-site, multi-site study. Uh, my group at Mountain Manor was privileged to be one of those sites. And just in summary, you're looking at a randomized trial of 150 or so uh, with opioid use disorder, randomized to uh, outpatient counseling following a brief outpatient detox versus the same outpatient counseling plus treatment with buprenorphine. It was a 12-week trial, and uh, the outcome here is opioid-positive urines, so south is good, north is bad. And you can see that baseline use for both groups was very high, that is 90-ish percent of urines were opioid-positive. You put these youngsters on buprenorphine, those are the dark uh, filled in black circles, and the rates of opioid positivity uh, over time go down quite substantially in both a statistically significant and clinically very meaningful way. And then as you taper the medicine, medicine at the end of the 12 week trial, it reverts to control. So not surprisingly, while you're treating with the medicine, it does well, doesn't when you're not using the medicine, it's not curative. And the glass half full view, as you'll hear me say, is that it makes a big difference uh, there is a reduction, you know, by uh, 50 percent or so in the rate, but you notice it doesn't go to zero, so it's not curative. We know less about naltrexone. Uh, this was uh, our group uh, in the first uh, case series looking at 20, our first 20 uh, youth treated with extended release naltrexone, and we got good outcomes at four months in about half of them not exactly a rate of evidence that we would like, uh, but a preliminary demonstration of safety, feasibility, and efficacy. And the data that we have from adults 
seems to translate well uh, into youth. Here is from Scott Hadlin's group up at Boston University Medical Center at the Graken Center. And this is a look at a much bigger cohort. This is Medicaid claims data uh, across 11 states looking at about 5,000 young people who received a diagnosis of OUD and wanting to see what their subsequent course of treatment retention was like based on receiving or not receiving MOUD treatment following an index diagnosis of OUD. The first thing that we learn is in a population of two and a half million young people, only 5%, only 5,000 were diagnosed with OUD, which is far below the known case prevalence rate in the general population. So lesson number one is that our case detection, our diagnosis, our noticing the incidence in real practice, or that is the presentation to treatment is way low. So we, we have that as a problem. The next problem is the penetration of treatment. Only 76% of this group of young people who had an actual diagnosis of OUD listed in a Medicaid claim had any treatment at all within three months of diagnosis. Only half of them, I'm sorry, only a quarter of them got medication. So a third of those that got any treatment got medication treatment, and that was only a quarter of the overall sample. And for people under, adolescents under 18, it was only 5%. So we're doing a pretty poor job with uptake and dissemination. On the other hand, for those that did get medication, you can see that the outcome data shows us that retention is far better for those that receive medication that those, than those that receive behavioral counseling or therapy services only. And the interesting thing is that that retention is better both for medication treatment, but also for all treatment and for behavioral treatment. So you don't, one of the nice things is you don't have to choose medication increases uh, retention and engagement in psychosocial treatment as well. Here is a study from Lisa Marsh uh, when she was still a New Yorker. Now she's uh, up in New Hampshire at Dartmouth. Uh, but this looks at duration of treatment a little bit. This was randomized uh, young people, 28 days treatment with buprenorphine versus 56 days with buprenorphine, and the outcome uh, being retention at the two month mark. So is it better to treat for a month and then taper off or to continue the treatment for the full two months? And not surprisingly, longer duration is better. An accident of the trial though, was that they started out requiring daily attendance just uh, as a safety measure and uh, an IRB imposition on uh, how to do what was essentially at that time relatively novel research in a vulnerable youth population. And they found that it was difficult to recruit. So midway during the trial, they switched to a lower level of restrictiveness uh, on participation and supervision so that the requirement was now attendance two or three days at clinic instead of five to seven days. It was kind of an accidental finding, and they weren't randomized into the two different levels uh, of requirement. So you can see on the left the initial requirement of daily, and on the right the subsequent modification. And participants who had intermediate program requirements were retained in treatment significantly longer than participants who had the very intensive program requirements. So we not only learn that longer duration is better, we also learn that there may be some factor in terms of the delivery system for the medicine as having a balance between our notion that on the one hand, these vulnerable youth need maximum dose of, meaning maximum dose of supervision, of touch, of interaction with therapy. But on the other hand, that might be a barrier to engagement and adherence uh, because it might be too intensive. And so somewhere there's a sweet spot and a balance between those things. That hasn't been well 
investigated or addressed in a in, in an active research program with a prospective design. But it does raise the interesting question: how much is enough in terms of the integrated counseling and other supports that we want to layer on and integrate with medication? Our intuition is that both are essential uh, for part of the holistic package, but we don't know enough about the dose and what the appropriate requirements are and that appropriate sweet spot. So more work needs to be done on that. Remember, I told you that we have evidence that comes in young people than in older adults. So I'm going to show you two examples of that. This is research from Zev Schumann Olivier up in Boston. This was in a big clinic attached to a general internal medicine academically affiliated clinic at the naturalistic outcomes. This is retention, but he also had uh, opioid use outcome uh, and the results were essentially the same. This is the retention. And he looked at dividing the populations retrospectively, older versus younger. And here you can see adults had significantly better retention than the emerging adults at all time points. And uh, you know, just to give you a, a benchmark, you see here about 40% retention of the young adults at six months compared to about 65% uh, retention uh, of the older adults. So glass half full, glass half empty. Thank goodness that the young adults are doing well. 40% uh, retention at six months is, is very good. Uh, but it's not good enough, so glass half empty, there's certainly room for improvement, and they don't do as well uh, as the older adults do, and I'm sure that doesn't shock you. Two of the same message, uh, this is a secondary analysis uh, that my group did looking at the XBOT trial. You may know that that was a seminal uh, large-scale randomized trial of buprenorphine versus extended-release naltrexone in adults, uh, we went back and reanalyzed the data comparing outcomes in the older adults versus the younger adults. There were about, uh, out of oh, 550 uh, total participants, uh, about 111 of them uh, were these young adults. And here you can see that the older adults, the outcome here is relapse to regular curves over the six month trial and older adults were less likely to relapse than young adults. And at six months, the rate of relapse was 49% in the older adults and 34% in the young adults. You'd be interested to hear that there was no statistically significant impact of whether they got either of the treatments, that which of the treatments they got, naltrexone, versus buprenorphine, but just in general, uh, the young adult as well, and, and the odds ratio here you know, is 1.9. So it's a pretty substantial effect. And so what are we going to do about that is what we'll spend the, you know, the second half uh, of, the, of the talk addressing. Just to summarize that research evidence, though, buprenorphine is effective, though the outcomes are not as good as they are for older adults. Longer treatment is better. There is no evidence for an arbitrary or pre-imposed time limitation. That's a very awkward conversation to have with a young person who might say, what do you mean, doc? I have to be on this medicine forever. No, I didn't say that. We're just saying longer is better. Let's get you stabilized. Let's talk later about time limitations and getting off. Right now, we're talking about getting on. We we'll talk about getting off later. Extended release naltrexone is quite promising, uh, good in the XBOT trial uh, secondary analysis that I just showed you. It was neither worse nor better for those initiating medicine, uh, including in the young adult population, uh, neither better nor worse than buprenorphine. But there is very little youth specific research, uh, and especially not in adolescents. The good news is that for both extended release naltrexone and for buprenorphine, Medications promote retention in all kinds of treatment for youth, both in the medication component 
and in the psychosocial component. Another piece of good news is that there is so far no signal at all for any additional safety problems or side effects based on age. Now, I'm not trying to oversell. All medicines have side effects. These medicines are no different, uh, but the side effect profile that we know about these medicines in older adults is not dissimilar than in younger adults, and there is no additional safety vulnerability conferred by a think work on important systems of uh, the mu opioid receptor system in the body, uh, there could have been endocrinological, endocrinological, say that five times fast, endocrinological effects uh, based on, on the developing um, endocrine system. There could have been brain effects. There, there could have been any number of things. So far, uh, there is no indication of that. So in conclusion, and clinical consensus clearly points to the use of medications as first line in the treatment of OUD in both adolescents and young adults. I would add that although we don't have the specific evidence, uh, it seems to me uh, intuitive that that should be, as I said, part of a comprehensive, holistic, integrated package that includes different modalities of care support, co-occurring therapy, SUD counseling, mutual and self-help, other elements, but that medications are essential and that there is no evidence for a fail-first strategy, by which I mean some people have advocated that, well, we ought to give kids uh, the chance to do well without medicines, and then if that doesn't work, maybe start them on medicines. No way. There is no evidence for that. Line and then think of what it means to strategize fail first in opioid use disorder, right? That failure might be an overdose, might be a fatal overdose. That seems to me to come at very high cost. So there's no evidence, uh, and that I think is not an appropriate strategy. First line. Well, if only it were that easy, right? All we, if all we had to do was just write more prescriptions for buprenorphine or naltrexone, wouldn't it that be easy? But of course, it isn't that easy. And we should talk a little bit about and what it is about young people uh, that makes it hard, uh, that makes these folks uh, difficult to engage, and that probably drives some of the differential uh, in treatment outcome compared to older people. So just to give you a flavor, uh, uh, a cartoon illustration, if you will, of what some of the difficulties are. Let me just uh, throw out a composite case. Uh, imagine a 22-year-old young man, but it could be a 16-year-old or 23-year-old young woman as well. Uh, but anyway, a 22-year-old young man, uh, he began cannabis at age 14. He began prescription opioids at age 17, progressing pretty rapidly to daily use with full physiological tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal within eight months of first initiation, and then within a year progressing to nasal heroin, and then within another six months to injection heroin. And that's pretty typical of the compressed or accelerated trajectory of opioid use, which this person went from first initiation of illicit use of opioid analgesic pills to injection heroin within a year and a half is really fairly typical. And you might contrast that with, say, the progression of alcohol use disorder, where you would never expect progression from first initiation of a beer to a handle of vodka every morning within 18 decades to evolve and is just a reflection of different properties of opioids and opioid use disorder. Anyway, this young man's had several episodes of care, three episodes of residential treatment, including uh, withdrawal management detox. He left two of those AMA or prematurely. He graduated uh, from one of those residential treatment episodes, but never followed the recommendations for ongoing outpatient continuing care. 
He did attempt one outpatient initiation of buprenorphine treatment. That didn't go so well. He met the doc who said, oh, you're uh, addicted to opioids. Uh, here's a month's prescription for buprenorphine and four refills and have a nice life. That didn't go so well, as you can imagine. He took it erratically. He sold half of it. He continued to use heroin on top of it. Not exactly a poster child for high quality and effective buprenorphine treatment. Anyway, so he's back in trouble. Uh, he's relapsed. He's in seven different kinds of crisis all in the past week. He's being kicked out by his parents. He's in trouble with the law. He's broken up with his girlfriend. He's in withdrawal. He's this close to being homeless. Maybe he is homeless. All the things that you can imagine. And in that crisis, he comes again presenting for treatment, seeking inpatient detox, and he meets me or he meets you or he meets your colleague. And he says, Doc, I, I'm miserable. Uh, I am I need treatment. I'm really ready now to get better. Uh, I acknowledge that maybe it didn't go as well and I didn't do what I was supposed to the times before, but this time I really mean it. And I'm going to do everything you say, I promise. I'll, I'll stand upside down naked in the rain if that's what it takes. You just tell me and I'll, I'll do it. Although I am kind of in a bit of a rush. And I'm just wondering um, how fast can we do this? I'd like to be out Friday because I want to go to this party I heard about Saturday night with my girlfriend. Oh, by the way, did I tell you I'm allergic to Suboxone? I can only take Subutex, right? That's because the mono product uh, is maybe more divertible than the combo product that has naloxone in it um, and, is, and it has more street value. Oh, and by the way, did I tell you that I have bad anxiety and only one thing works? And you guys can guess that I'm sure. Of course, it has to be Xanax. And no, you can't talk to the psychiatrists or, or the pediatrician or, or the general practitioner who's prescribing that Xanax. I'd prefer that you not talk to him. He doesn't know, by the way, that I use opioids. Oh, and no, I don't want you to talk to my mom. But other than that, I'm an open book and I'll do whatever you say. Now, I don't mean to trivialize this young man's suffering. Uh, obviously, he's a great risk for considerable morbidity and even mortality. Uh, I only use it as kind of a, as I say, cartoon illustration to perhaps emphasize some of the vulnerabilities conferred by the waxing, waning motivation and the difficulties in engaging uh, this young person who is not atypical at all. Thinking about what some of the features of this developmental vulnerability are, those of you who work with young people, uh, you know, right? They're invincible. Uh, they have lots of different kinds of immaturities. Uh, they are mostly less motivated than their adult counterparts and treatment does not have very strong appeal. Treatment mostly seems pretty lame to them. Uh, they have less salience of the consequences of use. Uh, that's both because they haven't lived long enough perhaps to have as many road models, as many consequences, but also because their social roles are not as demanding. So there's more wiggle room in terms of what they can uh, get away with in terms of functional impairment before the world uh, hits them over the head with consequences. And while there are burdens to treatment for all of our patients, the salience of those burdens uh, is very, very strong for young adults uh, who quickly lose steam and can think of lots of things they'd rather be doing than coming to a substance use treatment group. I'll tell you that. There's also the added in families, some of which have high effectiveness leverage, but more often low effectiveness leverage uh, by and we'll talk about this when we talk about family engagement but by the time these families uh, get to me to us they're up to their ears and alligators and don't know what to do in the crisis and they feel both uh, hopeless and disempowered the young people very typically have a very normative and developmentally appropriate but problematic pushback of dependence on their parents 
and the what they see as the over restrictiveness or over intrusiveness of their parents involvement. Uh, it's not a mom's business. Uh, I'm all grown up. I'm 18 in one day. I've got this. And uh, again, as our young man in the in the case said, you can't talk to my mom and she's got so much psychiatric comorbidity, not as much medical comorbidity as in older people. Uh, not that there's none. We certainly see uh, hepatitis. We certainly see HIV. We certainly see soft tissue infections. We certainly see a variety of sexually transmitted infections. But there's a lot and very prominent and high severity psychiatric comorbidity. I'm gonna, just in the interest of time, but I'm going to jump on now uh, to talk a little bit about a potential approach. That is, uh, since, well, I, no, actually, I will go back and just show you this. Um, because we did a big study uh, looking at maybe the largest cohort of youth with OUD in treatment uh, to date, uh, almost 300 folks coming through acute residential treatment and looking outcomes over six months. And it was interesting to see that although our standard of care is to emphasize, as I've been describing to you, uh, the use of MOUD, and many did accept our recommendation, many did not. So a third approximately elected to take extended release naltrexone before they left residential treatment, a third elected treatment with buprenorphine, but fully a third, a little more than a third said, no, thank you, I don't need your stinking meds. And that's in a setting in which we've already gone through the cultural transformation, transformation of making it, it first line. So that, that already is an illustration of the problem in uptake. Even worse than that though, happens kind of in usual care in terms of retention and uptake post-residential in terms of the low rates of ongoing engagement in treatment and uptake of MOUD. So over six months, this cohort who initiated extended release naltrexone, which was a third of the larger cohort, had 1.3 mean doses, right? And only 2% of them got all six monthly doses over the ensuing six months. And it was just about the same with buprenorphine that the mean days of taking buprenorphine over six months was about two months of the six. So the baseline usual care retention is problematic, probably related to the developmental difficulties we've been talking about. So what are we gonna do about it? And one of the things that our group's been developing uh, over the last few years, a multi-component, or I sometimes joke, kitchen sink approach to trying to throw potential uh, components of care meant to address these likely issues of uh, developmental vulnerability. We call it the Youth Opioid Recovery Support Intervention, or yours, and these are its four major components. Them uh, in some detail, but they are assertive outreach, family involvement, home delivery of MOUD using, we started with extended release naltrexone because it was the only one that was FDA approved when we started, but now since extended release buprenorphine uh, is available, it includes patient choice of either of those two medications, but delivered at home, plus motivational incentives for receipt of medication doses. So it's a heavy lift, it's a lot, uh, and as we'll talk about later, it's uh, research funded. I, so keep in mind that I don't yet know how to do this uh, in the real world for Medicaid pennies under standard reimbursement, but at least as we're developing it and we're fortunate enough to have some research grants, it's interesting to see uh, how it unfolds. Assertive treatment is not a new idea. It's well established with the treatment of a number of chronic illnesses in hard to reach populations with a waxing and waning course in which medication adherence is a major barrier, directly observed uh, medication therapies in TB and HIV. You guys know about assertive community treatment uh, with chronic and persistent mental illness, 
typically schizophrenia, in which a multidisciplinary team goes out into the community, typically uh, using, uh, for example, long-acting injectable antipsychotics. So the model is there, and this borrows heavily from that playbook. Uh, family engagement is another component, and there's lots of reasons why family engagement has not been the rule in substance use treatment. Uh, people, are, I think, are not well trained. I already talked about the normative pushback against young adults' subjective sense of parental restriction. Uh, the SUD field has long concentrated on the idea of insight and internal transformation and personal uh, recovery. And not that those things are not important, they certainly are, but those of you who work with young people know that behavioral change doesn't always come from the inside and waiting for the scales to fall with a lightning flash of epiphany, you could be waiting a long time for many young people. So how do we go? Oh, and I think another big barrier has been an over rigid concern with confidentiality, uh, which is to say, although confidentiality is of course a linchpin of a treatment and an important principle, uh, it is easy to overdo it uh, and to not think about ways in which we can share information in a productive way uh, with appropriate uh, consent. So I think families do have a core competence. I do think they have natural leverage. There are some cases in which families are so toxic that there is no hope. But I think that's the vast minority of families. Most families have a lot going for them. And besides, it's the families they have, and those families will be there long after we're no longer involved. Uh, so I think that thinking about what we can do to enhance the core competence that families already have and enhance that by giving them a recipe for treatment with clear role definition. Uh, can be a help, and that's the basis of what we've done uh, in, in trying to develop this intervention. I think that encouraging the emerging autonomy of youth and their personal self-efficacy is not incompatible, that's a double negative, is compatible with the empowerment of families, you, both ways. And to get families to think about what the key elements are, and some of those elements include in what framework, doing family education. So it's surprising, maybe it's not surprising, uh, how little families know about OUD, about its treatment, about the medicines. Uh, we start from day one trying to put together a three-way treatment plan, three-way that is the young person, the family, that's typically uh, a parental caregiver, often a mom, could be a grandparent, could be a dad, whatever is available, whoever the, whoever the young person selects, and, and, the, and the therapist. And the idea is that everybody's trying to get on the same page of, from day one and getting the ground rules of communication and getting releases signed up front and saying, who should know what? Who want to be informed about how things are going? Uh, telling, asking the youngster, how will you like us to keep your mom abreast? How much is enough information, how much is too much information, uh, what are the core kinds of things that we shouldn't be talking about. But on the other hand, remember, we are going to want to call the cavalry and push the panic button if we need to. Mom, you have to trust us that you're not going to get all the gory details, but we'll tell you what you need to know. Mom, what will you do to support attendance? What will you want to know about whether or not they got their dose of medication, about whether they showed up for a treatment attendance, whether or not their urine was positive for opioids or other things or not. And if it doesn't go well, God forbid, how do you want that to go in your family? What would be the consequence of missing a session, missing a dose, having a positive urine, relapsing? Would you come back to inpatient? Uh, how do you want that to go in your family? What would you like us to ask your mom to do if, God forbid, th things don't go well. 
And let's negotiate and get that written down now when everybody's briefly motivated at the outset before we're in relapse mode and lying mode and covering up. What's the backup plan or rescue plan? And what's the backup plan to the backup plan if there's trouble? And I know that you're motivated now and you think it's all smooth sailing and going to go well. And mom, you're very confident that they're fixed, but we hope that's true. But just in case, let's think about the alternative scenarios. And there's lots of work on coaching the parents about prioritizing the different treatment goals and picking your battles. Yeah, I know that it's frustrating that he won't clean his room, but how about this week we concentrate on injection heroin use and cleaning the room can be next week if you don't mind. Those kinds of conversations are maybe not surprising to you, but when I was starting this work, surprising to me how uh, diffuse people were, the parents were, as I said, uh, in crisis, up to their ears and alligators and not knowing where to turn and how to prioritize treatment goals. We use medication receipt as one of the, if not the primary treatment goals because it's easier to understand, it's concrete, it's easy to operationalize. Recovery is diffuse, functional improvement, is hard to measure, but whether or not you get the medicine is a high impact, easily operationalizable, easily verifiable outcome. And it has such an important uh, impact on outcome. The other thing is that it's familiar to families, kind of thinking about utilization of medical services and what it's like to care for a sick kid. Every mom has had the experience of a cranky, truculent, febrile four-year-old with otitis media who doesn't want to take the pink medicine. And what am I going to do about it? Now, a, a four-year-old you know, with otitis who you can put in a basket hold and squirt the amoxicillin in their mouth, that's different than a 190-pound 21-year-old you know, who doesn't want to get his Vivitrol. But still, the core concept is similar. A, a young person who's sick, who's not in his right mind, who doesn't have a good sense of priorities, who's irritable and distressed because he's sick, who doesn't know how to utilize healthcare services, right? That's, that's a sweet spot for a mom. Moms know how to do that, at least in concept. So drawing on that, uh, as the, as the basis and medicalizing it, if you will, and giving a recipe. In addition, I talked about home delivery. That's another uh, of the components. Literally meeting where meeting them where they are, rather than waiting passively for them to come into clinic. And contingency management. That's a well established uh, research intervention, uh, but little uptake in real world care. Other contingency management that's been better studied is motivational incentives for producing a negative urine, our target behavior is less well established, but maybe more generalizable, and that is receipt of the medication dose. So the, the young people uh, get $25 for the first dose, $30 for the second dose, $35, et cetera, in an escalating uh, kind of sequence uh, to try to create uh, incentivization for that important goal. Just to give you some vignettes, about how this is going. Uh, this might be, you know, one of the, the, the poster child candidates. Uh, imagine uh, a 21 year old, maybe it's even the same uh, kid that I illustrated before. Uh, he's an injection heroin user. He's had several inpatient uh, detox admissions and, and rehab treatments over the past couple of years. And previously has gotten first doses of extended release naltrexone. The same could apply to extended release buprenorphine. It just hasn't been around that long. Uh, but gets a first dose, gets all excited uh, about ongoing treatment, and I'm going to keep getting these doses. I'm going to keep coming to counseling. I'm going to keep working with you, Dr. Fishman, but then never comes back for a second dose and quickly relapses. And then months later, it, while in crisis, you know, comes back through the revolving uh, detox door. Well, now uh, on this fifth 
uh, episode of uh, residential care. He gets enrolled in the yours program and mom, a uh, grandmom is elected to be the treatment significant other, the parental caregiver. And he again gets a first dose of medicine while inpatient. And now it's a month later and the home delivery team shows up at home with the dose. And now he's changed his mind. No, thank you. I don't need your stinking medicines. I'm good. And I don't know what his motivation is. I don't know if he's I'm good because I'm going to keep doing well and I don't need medication because I'm fixed or if it's well, I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to not using heroin. And so that's the reason I don't want the medicine. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what he's thinking, but grandma's not having it. I can try to persuade him to stick with it and explain why that's important and why the medicine is critical. But grandma says, nah, no is not an option. You're getting the medicine and it's a done deal. She's got the kind of leverage based on love and relationship and her parental caregiver role and moral authority and whatever else that I could never have. And so this young man then goes on and does very well and gets six doses. Uh, and it's very different in terms of activating the parental role for that leverage uh, that I as a professional you know, could never have. Just to show you some examples of how we do this assertive communication, we like to use group texts. So we've got the kid and the therapist and the parental caregiver, a mom or a grandma or a dad, as I said, and we're, we're texting. It's a nice way of having open and transparent communication. Uh, here's an example of just some monitoring. Uh, hey, Ms. Blank, this is the mom. Just want to let you know that Brittany got her shot. No problem. Great. Thank you so much. Another example. Uh, hey, Dave, he's the dad. You might have already surmised this since you were visiting when we arrived, but just want to let you know that Jeremy is back on the shot. That's great news. Thank you. Uh, so we can catch him being good and report positive outcomes, or we can uh, report difficulties, and it's clear that everybody knows. Well, what I call maintaining therapeutic optimism, the kids saying to the therapist, hey, I'm getting kicked out because you told my mom I didn't leave a urine, so yeah, I'm gonna have to stop the study. Or you can come leave a urine. I couldn't pee, what was I supposed to do? Wait two hours until I could? And now I have to go live in the city in a, in a, ban, a bando, a, 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 an abandoned building. I'm still here, come leave a urine. Don't use this as an excuse to relapse. Thanks for everything, goodbye, cruel world. And then later it unfolds, all right, I'm coming up to leave a urine. So just keeping at it in this assertive way and not taking no for an answer. Here's an illustration of uh, another example of parental leverage. Uh, the team comes to the house and they're trying to find a, uh, a private place in the house, the injection dose, and mom is hovering. And the patient says, mom, you can't be in here while I'm getting the shot. And the therapist appropriately thinking about confidential health care says, ma'am, I think it's best if we provide her privacy for the injection. And the mother says, are you kidding me? Of course I'm staying. I'm not leaving this room till I see that medicine go in you. And, and I'm not endorsing mom's position. Maybe it's over intrusive. Maybe it's overly. Uh, infantilizing, I, I don't know, but it's an illustration, but it works. And it's an illustration that a mom can have that the rest of us can't and trying to draw on uh, a multiplication of that leverage. All right, we're gonna run out of time. So I wanna just show you a little bit of our data. Uh, we've now done one randomized trial. This was with uh, extended release naltrexone alone, as I said, because it was the only one that was approved. Uh, it was an N of 38 in which we randomized young adults to either this yours intervention. And a quick snapshot of the data. Here's a histogram of receipt of cumulative doses. The red is the yours intervention and the gray is treatment as usual. And you can see that the dose and tapered quickly out where there was a relatively robust delivery of medication uh, in the yours group. The mean number of doses delivered over six months was 4.3. 
and 44% got all six doses compared to zero. The survival uh, curve of relapse-free status, so uh, this is essentially how people are relapsing over time, and in the treatment as usual group, by six months, about 95% uh, had relapsed. Half glass full, glass half full, it's much better uh, in the yours group, and the hazard ratio is 2.72, but glass half empty is 60% still relapsed in the yours group uh, at six months. So as much as we did better, uh, there's certainly room for improvement. And we did a second pilot study. This was non-randomized, but when uh, extended release buprenorphine was approved, we now added choice. And so in the second trial, we had 22 young people in the yours condition, half of them extended release naltrexone, half of them extended release buprenorphine. And side by side, the results are, which was naltrexone only to study two, which was uh, either medication and the relapse uh, survival curves are, are essentially the same. Uh, and I'm not showing you the data and we certainly weren't powered to do the comparison, but there was really no difference in the performance of those that elected extended release naltrexone versus extended release buprenorphine. So um, I just wanna, oh, this is interesting. Um, we've done an adaptation for the pandemic which is in thinking about infection control, we're now, rather than going into people's homes, we're using a mobile van delivery. And here's a picture of Nurse Stanley Moody delivering a, a dose in the back of the van. It's a one at a time kind of more disinfectable, controllable uh, place to be able to do it. And I just wanna mention a couple of other interesting innovative practices that are floating around. One is integration into primary care in a hub and, sp hub and spoke kind of model. Uh, this has been pioneered by Sharon Levy up at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And she's now brought this to several dozen primary care pediatric practices uh, in the broad Massachusetts area. The mothership or the hub, if you will, is her specialty center where she disseminates consultation and support out to primary youth serving, mostly pediatric, although some family practice uh, practices as well. They're the spokes and helping them be able to bring MOUD treatment uh, into their practices where they already know how to work with young people. They've been working successfully in primary care with young people uh, for forever. And so this just adds another tool. Many of the primary care practices, as you can imagine, would be hesitant early on saying, gosh, we didn't sign up to be specialty SUD providers. If we start providing buprenorphine treatment and put up a shingle that says buprenorphine within, we'll be turning them away. There'll be lines outside around the block for all sorts of people wanting buprenorphine. And that's not the point at all. And by the way, it doesn't happen. The, the notion is that these patients are already in your practice. These are occult cases that aren't coming forward because you haven't provided this kind of treatment. They're there under your nose. It's not that people will come from elsewhere in the community and migrate to see you as specialty care providers. It's that you wanna add this tool to your tool chest for the patients that are already in your care, much as you would add any other tool for any other chronic remitting relapsing illness. And then one other practice uh, that's been starting to gain some traction is the notion of recovery housing that is specific for youth. And recovery housing is a common element uh, in the treatment continuum of care. It's actually usually not treatment, right? It's supervised housing. And you can imagine people might be homeless or might be housing unstable, or their parents might not want them to come back yet uh, to the home, or they might not be able to afford uh, independent living. But when young adults go into adult style recovery housing, which is common, they tend not to do well. For a number of reasons. One, there's not enough supervision. They don't have ind good independent living skills, and so they 
don't really know how to care for themselves uh, entirely independently. And secondly, in a paradoxical way, there's both too little supervision and too much supervision because there's a fair number of rigid rules and they always break them, right? Because the kids get up to shenanigans and the girlfriend is in the room and they break the curfew and then they get thrown out. So this notion is thinking about youth specific developmentally informed recovery housing that takes into account the kind of shenanigans that young people kind of supervision that can be youth friendly and embeds it in a full continuum of care and in addition to supervised housing when people don't do well because the expectation is that it won't be unilinear success many if not most will have a stuttering course of three steps forward and two steps back and kicking them out because they don't do well is not the right approach but some kind of temporary increase in the level of care and then bringing them back into the recovery house is a more appropriate and developmentally meaningful way to go all right let's quit and I've gone long, but I do want to give a chance, if we have a moment, for questions, if that's all right. Dr. Fishman, thank you so much. There are a few questions um, that have come in. Um, I appreciate this. I think uh, we could probably have added a third in your series. Um, so I just, a uh, housekeeping note, this question has come in, and I see another have popped in. Um, we will put materials up on our website, so look for those. Um, I would imagine by Monday, so a copy of this recording and the slides and any um, links or additional materials will be there on Monday. So that's come in a couple of times. Um, I see some thank yous coming in, Dr. Fishman, but here is a clinical question. Do you think the decreased success rate in young adults has to do with the neurobiology of younger brains versus older adults? So the plasticity causing greater chance of addiction related to neurotransmitters. That's from Dr. Rossman. Well, I think that probably is likely to be part of it. Uh, for sure, we know, you know, from modern neuroscience that much of the and functional immaturity of young people has brain correlates. Uh, but we don't need to go on to also be able to draw on the rich history of descriptive psychology and to think about spiritual aspects and to think about peer influences and to think about uh, independent living skills broadly across multiple domains. So I think, yes, that's going to end up be part of it. Uh, certainly things like uh, immature executive function and higher levels of impulsivity, but whether or not we can ever get to the reductionistic understanding of neurotransmission and neurocircuitry mechanism, uh, we, we know that it's a, a, a broad-based phenomenon. It will be interesting to see whether advances in neuroscience and getting that mechanistic look under the hood will lead to interventions, but so far, unfortunately, but very, very interesting, those of you, you know, who followed uh, what we what we are learning about mechanism, uh, it, it is quite fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Fishman. And then Dr. Fami, um, there are two questions here. I'll just present them to you together. He's asked, can more than six doses of naltrexone be given? And also, if there are studies looking at long-acting naltrexone versus uh, a, a combination of buprenorphine and naltrexone. Um, so, yeah, great question. I just showed six months as an outcome because that was the duration of care in the research study that we did. Uh, but more relevant to broad community care is the notion that longer is better. And there, as I said, is no information about the imposition or the need to impose predetermined or arbitrary time limitations. Uh, we don't know what the optimal duration of care is. We don't know in adults, and we know even less in young adults and adolescents. I typically ask people to think with me to use a functional clock rather than a chronological clock. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means Let's get you onto treatment for as least as long as it takes to get you back on your feet. What have you lost from addiction? 
uh, let's get that recouped. Is it getting back to work, back to school, back with your loved ones, back with your romantic partner, squared with your family, out of trouble with the law, over your depression, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then when you're stable, then we can think about what maintenance needs to be and when you can come off of the medicine. But we don't know how long that will take. So let's go by your own personal functional landmarks. Oh, okay, that makes sense. But really, Doc, how long? And then I say, I don't know, give me a year. And I don't have data for that. It's more than a day, less than a lifetime. It's a round number. So I typically uh, say, let's let's try this for a year, and then we can talk about what the next steps are. And I got to say, unfortunately, I rarely make it to a year because people drop out. And we talked about part of the problems uh, with retention. And so I wish I could make it to a year. It is much more a problem getting people to stay on medicine than it is how to get them off. So, again, the best we can say is longer is better. Because, unfortunately, most people who stop medicine do relapse. Now, that's not true of everybody, but we don't know enough about how to pros prospectively select those who will do well tapered off medicine versus those that need to stay on indefinitely. And your thoughts or studies, just to wrap up Dr. Fami's question of, of buprenorphine versus naltrexone? So the biggest study we have is, as I mentioned, XBOT. Uh, that was in 500 or so uh, adults, but that included the young adults that um, uh, comparing sublingual buprenorphine to extended release naltrexone. And the two punchlines to that study were that Getting onto naltrexone is harder than getting onto buprenorphine. You already knew that, but that was an important result. That is, uh, some 20% or so of people didn't make it onto now. Those who were randomized to naltrexone didn't make it onto the naltrexone. It's a little harder, as you know. Uh, it takes uh, a washout period. Uh, many people don't make it to the starting gate, even, they drop out. Uh, before they get onto the medicine, whereas buprenorphine had a much higher rate of initiation or induction. Having said that, though, if you compared the populations of people who first started medicine, who got onto at least one dose of either medicine, they're identical. So if you look at everybody, buprenorphine did better because of the people who never made it onto naltrexone, and the difference was largely represented by the naltrexone non-initiators who then relapsed versus looking at the per protocol population who got onto medicine and they had identical six month outcomes. We have not yet seen a study comparing extended release buprenorphine to extended release naltrexone. That's gonna be very interesting when we see that because one of the things we think about extended release naltrexone is just the formulation of a monthly injection as opposed to the requirement for daily adherence is an advantage, never dynamics and the pharmacological effect. But if both medicines, the buprenorphine and the naltrexone have that advantage, it'll be very interesting to see how they do. I'll tell you what I suspect. I suspect that the horse race question of which is the better medicine is probably the wrong question. And more important is what are the patient matching characteristics for which medicine is better for which person? And so the answer about which medicine is better, the answer to that is yes. But the answer to which medicine is better for a particular person at a particular time in the course of their OUD trajectory, that's what we really need to want, what we really want to learn. And, and unfortunately, we don't know that yet. Uh, but we look forward to studies that will help elucidate that. Thank you, Dr. Fishman. Um, we have answered all of the questions in the chat. There are some uh, grateful comments and appreciation uh, for a very informative talk. Uh, so I will not read them all, but just tell you there are lots of thank yous and uh, comments on how informative and useful this talk was. So thank you again for joining us for the second uh, talk sort of in a series. We accidentally stumbled upon a series here and perhaps we'll pull you into 
another. Thank you for spending the time. Yeah, and just the last word, I encourage any of you who are new to this work uh, to dip your toe in the water. You know, if you have the patients uh, already uh, in front of you, but you've been skeptical about what to do, it isn't as daunting or as hard as it seems. These are relatively forgiving. They are relatively easy to use, especially for maintenance uh, once they've been initiated. And so I would encourage you uh, to give it a try uh, to bring this work to your young adult and adolescent patients. And if anybody wants to reach out to me uh, individually, part of what we do uh, with the, the MAX uh, format is make available consultation. I'm happy to talk about cases. I'm happy to coach people through uh, these difficult, not difficult, but through these issues to get you started. So I hope I can be of some help with that. Thank you. Yep, that's exactly right. We're happy to help. Um, if folks are interested in getting their waiver, we can help uh, with that training. And if people have general questions, we're happy to help individual providers or practices as a whole. So uh, that's a great way to end. We appreciate that, Dr. Fishman. And thanks everyone for spending some of your afternoon with us. Um, have a wonderful uh, holiday season if you're about to celebrate or are celebrating and certainly a great new year. We're looking forward to a nice 2021. So thank you. Better everybody. year to come. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're hoping. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.